entire chapter, I'd like to welcome you all to the 32nd Annual Federalist Society Student Symposium. We are very excited to have you all here, and we're looking forward to our many wonderful panelists. But before we get started, I want to thank a few people who have made this symposium possible. First, I'd like to thank the National Office for choosing us to host this year's symposium, and for their support over this past year as we prepared for this weekend. Additionally, we are so grateful to the University of Texas and our other sponsors, particularly the Claremont Institute and the Fund for American Studies. I'd also like to thank all of our wonderful speakers and moderators who have taken time out of their busy schedules to be here with us this weekend. We're certainly looking forward to everything that they have to say. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my chapter's executive board and symposium committee, particularly Alex Hughes, Colin White, and Shannon Smith, who have worked so hard to pull everything together. I'm so glad that y'all could join us here in Austin this weekend. We have over 40, or I'm sorry, 40, we have over 400 registered attendees from over 50 different law schools, and it's so great to all come together for some lively conversation on our topic, the federal Leviathan. As you know, we will be exploring many topics this weekend, from environmental law to civil rights law, and all panels should prove to be dynamic and engaging. Tonight, we will begin with a panel on crony capitalism, featuring a number of great speakers and Judge Jerry Smith of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit as our moderator. Before we get started, I just want to make two announcements. Tomorrow, um, in order to park in lot 40 at the LBJ School, you will need to let the security guard know that you are with the symposium. So if anyone's planning on driving, just remember that. And secondly, a more fun announcement, our unofficial after party tonight will be at Rattle Inn, which is at 6th and Noises downtown. So thank you all for coming, and I'm happy to turn it over to Judge Smith to kick off our opening panel. Thank you, and welcome to the sequester vigil. <laughs> Lights will go out promptly at 11 p.m. Central Time. <laughs> Fortunately, before then, there will be a good uh, uh, cocktail hour until we will say goodbye to the earth. <laughs> so our topic is, is uh, crony capitalism, uh, and I thought I'd do a little bit of research into how that term is sometimes defined. I, of course, went to the preeminent source first, which is Wikipedia. It says that crony capitalism is a term describing an economy in which success in business depends on close relationships between business people and government officials. It may be exhibited by favoritism in the distribution of legal permits, government grants, special tax breaks, or other, form, or, or, or other forms. Crony capitalism is believed to arise from political cronyism spills over into the business world. Self-serving <coughs> friendships and family ties between businessmen and the government influence the economy and society to the extent that it corrupts public serving economic and political ideas. When we look at Breitbart, Breitbart says crony capitalism, parenthesis, or crony socialism, has become a popular buzz phrase to describe our bailout nation and the scandalous loans made to companies like Solyndra, the takeover of the mortgage markets, TARP, nationalizing American auto companies, and the stimulus green energy rackets are but a few examples of the crony capitalism epidemic. And then last, but certainly not least, we have to consult the Huffington Post <laughs> to the following. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to speak that hard. Sorry about that. So, uh, Huffington Post says, P.T. Barnum may have said it best, but when it comes to horn-swoggling suckers, few compare to the fast-talking peddlers of utopian technologies who have become the new kings of crony capitalism, feasting on billions in federal grants, subsidies, tax breaks, loans, and mandates. There is hardly a single uneconomic, unsustainable cure worse than the disease violates the second law of thermodynamics idea left out there that hasn't been used to separate progressives from other people's money. So therefore we have crony capitalism and we have a terrific uh, panel uh, tonight to discuss crony capitalism and its various aspects uh, with you. Let me introduce our panelists. 
who will then uh, each have 15 minutes to give uh, an opening presentation and in the short time to respond to each other. And then we've saved plenty of time for questions uh, from you. So I hope you're uh, working up some good questions as you listen to these presentations. Uh, first is John Allison, President and CEO of the Cato Institute. Uh, he was recognized by the Harvard Business Review as one of the top 100 most successful CEOs in the world over the last decade. He's a former distinguished professor of practice at Wake Forest University School of Business and serves on the Board of Visitors at the business schools at Wake Forest, Duke, and UNC at Chapel Hill. Before joining Cato, uh, he was chairman and CEO of BB&T Corporation, the 10th largest financial services holding company headquartered uh, in the United States. Second is Viday Enzalibi, who is Associate Dean for Faculty and Research and Professor of uh, Law at Northwestern University. Can you just go off? Yes. He joined Northwestern's faculty as an assistant professor in 2000, and in 2004 became a full professor. He became a full professor in 2008, excuse me. He previously served as the Bigelow Teaching Fellow and Lecturer of Law at the University of Chicago before joining Northwestern. He has served as a visiting professor at the law schools of Harvard, NYU, Chicago, and Tel Aviv University. His research and teaching interests include international trade, foreign relations law, public and private international law, and contracts. Third is Henry Hugh, who holds the Alan Shivers Chair in the Law of Banking and Finance here at the University of Texas Law School. From a research standpoint, he's best known for his articles on the law and economics of modern capital markets, financial innovation, and corporate governance. Uh, he's also, since I'm a double daily, I have to say that he's a triple daily. I'm not sure I've ever met him before. Uh, he holds a, a BS in molecular biophysics and biochemistry, an MA in economics, and a JD, all from Yale University. And finally, we will hear from Jonathan Macy, Harvard College, Yale Law School, Sam Harris, Professor of Corporate Law, Finance, and Securities Regulation uh, uh, at Yale, and on the Board of Directors for the Yale Law School Center for the Study of Corporate Governance, Chair of the Yale University Advisory Committee on Investor Responsibility, and among his other distinctions, was uh, given the Paul Bator Award for Excellence in Teaching, Scholarship, and Public Service, awarded by the University of Chicago, the law school chapter of the Federal Society in 1995. But with that, we will begin then with John Ellis. Thanks, Judge, and good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. I always enjoy having the opportunity to talk to uh, bright young people who will be future leaders in our society. Uh, my topic is crony capitalism and the financial crisis. Um, I may have a little different perspective. I'm not an attorney. I'm a business guy. I ran a, law, ran a large bank that grew from a small bank, and I come from that perspective. I recently wrote a book called Financial Crisis and the Free Market Cure. I'll tell you a couple reasons I wrote the book. I was the largest, longest serving CEO of a major financial institution, and I th thought it might be interesting for somebody that actually knew what was going on to talk about the financial crisis. I, <laughs> all you read in the press, 95% of it is not true. Uh, secondly, status has done a great job of creating a myth. A myth has done a lot of damage uh, because it's been the foundation of very bad public policy. And the myth is that the cause of the financial crisis is the deregulation of the financial services industry and greed on Wall Street. Well, the banking business, financial services industry, was not deregulated. We had a massive increase in regulation under Bush. We had the Patriot Act, uh, the Privacy Act, and Sarbanes-Oxley. The industry was misregulated, not deregulated. And, se and secondly, uh, while in my 40-year career there's been plenty of greed on Wall Street, there's not one shred of evidence there was any more greed than usual that created financial crisis. That was just made up out of whole cloth. Um, in my book, I really have uh, six basic themes. First, the uh, fundamental cause of the financial crisis was government policy. We don't live in a free market in the United States. We live in a very mixed economy. 
mixture varies by industry. Uh, technology is the least regulated industry and has done very well uh, through this uh, economic ch uh, challenging time. Financial services industry is the most regulated in industry in the world. It's not surprising that our big problems are in the most regulated industry. Secondly, government policy created was a massive misinvestment, what's called a bubble. That misinvestment got focused in the residential real estate market. We created, in fact, $3 trillion and argumented with the up to $8 trillion, too much residential real estate. That bubble burst, as all bubbles do, destroying trillions of dollars of wealth and, and millions of jobs. The two primary culprits that created that bubble were errors made by the Federal Reserve in the early 2000s, where Alan Greenspan, who was head of the Federal Reserve, wanted to go out as a hero, so he printed a bunch of money. That tends to create an incentive for us to overconsume, which we did. Uh, that overconsumption got focused in housing, primarily because of the affordable housing, i.e. subprime lending policies of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, these giant government-sponsored enterprises that would never have existed in a free market. When Freddie and Fannie failed, they owed $5 trillion and had $2 trillion in subprime mortgages. They dominated the subprime mortgage business. Thirdly, a number of very large financial institutions, so-called Wall Street, made very serious mistakes. Many of these institutions are classic crony capitalists. They should have been allowed to fail. Uh, however, their mistakes were secondary and were highly incented by government policy. Fourthly, and very unfortunately, almost everything we've done since the financial crisis started, even things that may improve your standard of living in the short term will definitely reduce your standard of living in the long term. We have sold the future, uh, and we're going to have negative consequences for that. Uh, fifthly, the real cause of the financial crisis, the real cure is philosophical. It actually rates in the way to rule of law, so I hope you'll read my book, because I don't have time to talk about the philosophical issues today, but I think it'll give you something to reflect on. And finally, and most unfortunately, the United States faces some really serious economic problems. If you look at the unfunded liabilities under Social Security, Medicare, under the new Obamacare program, uh, under unfunded government pension plans, we have over $100 trillion in unfunded liabilities. We have operating deficits in excess of a trillion dollars a year. We have a dysfunctional foreign policy. We have a big problem with retirement of the baby boomer generation. And we have a failed K through 12 education system by any kind of objective standards. Uh, for your generation, this is a big deal because this has nothing to do with politics. But mathematically, in 15 to 20 years, unless we change direction, the United States will go bankrupt. Now, countries go bankrupt by printing money and, and hyperinflating, but we have to change direction. We can if we have the courage to do so, but we can't do it without some pain. Let me talk a minute then in relation to that financial crisis. Let's talk a little bit about crony capitalism. I think crony capitalism is a bad name. I think it's really crony status. But capitalism is an economic system where the government doesn't get involved in the economy. It's an oxymoron uh, to use the term crony capitalism by definition. It's a classic example of statists trying to grab a term, just like the, you know, the classical liberals that really believed in liberty, and now we have modern liberals that don't believe in liberty. Uh, and so they take over these terms. I believe it's very important to call it uh, crony statism. And, and that also has to do with who actually causes it. I have no empathy for businesses that look for favor for the government. I think they're really bad people. However, the government's the one that doles out the favors. Uh, they're the ones that make those decisions. It, it's analogous if you're a grown-up and your 16-year-old kid comes to see you and says, well, you know, I'd like to have some money to go, go drink some beer and have a party tonight, and you give them the money and they have a wreck, it's their fault, but it's also your fault. You chose to make that decision, and the government is the one doling out the favors. So no empathy for businesses to look for favors, but really, ultimately, it's government responsibility. Let me talk about crony capitalism maybe from a different perspective than people think of it. The ultimate crony capitalists are the Federal Reserve. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this. The Federal Reserve was created primarily uh, by uh, the, with the support of large New York banks back in 1913. And the New York banks periodically we had panics because they leveraged themselves too much, and they were and they were now getting competition from regional banks. And they thought, wow, wouldn't it be great if the government would loan me money whenever I had a bad time? That would be nice, right? And so the Federal Reserve was really created at the bequest of large New York banks. To this day, the New York Fed plays a special role. And then over the years, the Fed has constantly been passing out crony capitalist favors. 
big favors. In my career, Citigroup has failed three times and been bailed out by the Federal Reserve three times. General Motors was bailed out by the Federal Reserve. Contrary, hundreds of thousands of small builders, uh, residential builders in the United States went broke under the recent financial crisis. Now, I don't think they should have been bailed out by the Federal Reserve, but why? They did a lot more damage to our economy letting those small builders go broke than letting Citigroup go broke. But so they're doling out favors always in the name of the public good, but typically to people that have political clout and political connections. How about Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae? I don't know if anybody knows what Freddie Mac and Fannie, you've probably heard of them. If you go down to a bank or a mortgage bank or anybody and get a loan today, there's a 90% probability that your loan, 90% that your loan will be sold either Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, or FHA. They absolutely dominate the home mortgage finance business in the U.S. And the reason for that, the government guarantees their debts. Now, they were private entities until they failed. Wouldn't it be nice to have the government guarantee your debts? <laughs> uh, before they failed, they were leveraged a thousand to one. What that meant is for every dollar in equity they had, they had $1,000 in debt. It would be like you have a net worth of $10,000 and owing $10 million. That's the numbers. Now, you can only do that if the government guarantees your debts, right? Before they failed, the financial services industry computed that the taxpayers were subsidizing the shareholders of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae to the tune of over a billion dollars a year. And of course, the people that ran Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, Frank Raines and Jim Johnson, well, they all went crony campus. They were all political people. They knew nothing about running a business, which is one reason they went broke. And they tried to get brownie points with the government by having these very aggressive affordable housing, i.e. subprime lending programs. Um, I bet you think our accounting system is a private accounting system and crony capitalism couldn't possibly affect the accounting system. It's a very objective system. Not so. The accounting system in the United States is run by the government. It's controlled by the SEC. They make the rules. They call the general accepted accounting principles. Now, I've dealt with hundreds of thousands of businesses in my career, and I've never met a business that ran its business based on general accepted accounting principles. If they did, they'd go rogue, which tells you a lot about the principles. Everybody runs their numbers using their own analysis, and then they, they provide government-based reports. I'll tell you a little story about how those general accepted accounting principles got uh, uh, Form. There's lots of stories like this, but this is actually the specific story about crony capitalism and, and the impact on the financial crisis. Uh, a number of years ago, a company called Countrywide, you ever heard of Countrywide? The yeah. world's largest mortgage broker went broke, uh, did a lot of damage, did a lot of really bad loans. Well, Countrywide in those days was, was a relatively small business, and they were a broker, which meant they made mortgages and they had to sell them to somebody. They were competing with banks like my company, bp and We made mortgages and we put them on our books. And they said, and they started talking to Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and they, along with a few academics, figured out, wow, there's a way we can change the mathematics and the accounting system of mortgage loans that would be hugely to our favor. And here was the theory, and there was a theoretical argument around this, was if you look at the income that a bank gets on a mortgage loan, it has two components. One is the interest expense, and the other is what they call a servicing fee. Because we collect the payments, we pay the insurance, we pay taxes. And they said, why don't we t treat these two differently, and let's take this servicing fee and let's capitalize it on the front end, because just when we make a loan, we get this valuable asset. What that did was change radically the accounting treatment of mortgage loans. You could make a lot more money on the front end selling the mortgage to Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae versus, versus portfolio of the mortgage like the BB&T used to do. It changed the numbers radically. Now, over the life of a mortgage, it didn't matter, but mortgages are 15 to 20 year instruments, so it took you 15 years to get even. Now, there's an interesting quirk about this. Uh, first, it got implemented through the SEC with the help of people like Dodd Frank and Barney, I mean, uh, uh, Chris Dodd and Barney Frank. They got this implemented because they had some very special relationships with Countrywide that encouraged this whole process to happen. And uh, the implications are interesting and they actually contribute to the financial crisis. Because in, in Countrywide's case and in Freddie and Fannie's case, as long as mortgage production numbers were going up, their earnings were magnified because you were constantly bringing earnings forward. But as soon as volume started going down, your earnings went down faster because you'd already captured part of the earnings. So these guys had to keep growing this pie no matter what. That's why they kept making mortgage loans long after it was obvious the market had peaked and bad things were happening because the earnings implications were huge and they thought, well, the market will turn around next week, next month. Uh, very interesting, interesting phenomenon. Um, 
Another interesting thing is to reflect on how the different companies were treated during the crisis. One of the things that created a crisis versus a correction was the arbitrariness of decisions made uh, as the crisis was unfolding. This was during the Bush administration. You can't blame uh, the President administration for this. But very arbitrary decisions that magnified the uncertainty and ambiguity in the marketplace. For example, uh, Wachovia was basically forced to sell, quote, failed. They were sold to Citigroup initially. Now, Citigroup, everybody in the market that had a brain knew was in worse shape than Wachovia. So they were bailing out Wachovia, selling them to a worse company. Then they reneged on the contract they entered into and turned around and sold Wachovia to Wells Fargo, creating huge uncertainty in the, in the, in the economy. Why is that? Citigroup has a lot more contacts in Washington, D.C. with the regulators than Wachovia did. Interesting implication. How about some more interesting stories? Bear Stearns, the first large uh, investment bank that failed in the financial crisis. Anybody in the financial industry knew that Bear Stearns was a, a relatively small player. If they went broke, there was no uh, contagion risk. Yes, their shareholders and their bondholders would lose some money, but there was no threat to the market. The Federal Reserve, in my view, and I think most people that really understood what happened, arbitrarily chose to save Bear Stearns for reasons that are really still obscure to this day. Once they did that, they had made, they made an implication to everybody else in the marketplace that they were going to save all the large investment banks. And then they chose to let Lehman Brothers fail. Now, Lehman Brothers was a much larger, much more important institution than Bear Stearns. The market was stunned when that happened, not because it couldn't absorb Lehman Brothers' failure, but, it, but they created this false expectation. And here was the bad thing, and this is where crony capitalism plays an interesting role. Uh, Hank Paulson was head of the Secretary, was the Secretary of the Treasury, and he made the decision to save Bear Stearns and not to save Lehman Brothers. But everybody in the capital markets knew is that Hank, uh, Paulson had come out of Goldman Sachs. It was another minor financial crisis a few years ago called the long-term capital crisis. Goldman Sachs was in serious trouble in that crisis, and the other investment banks and the New York Federal Reserve bailed Goldman Act out, and Lehman Brothers wouldn't participate. So it was well known that he hated Lehman Brothers. The market assumed that, wow, there was no rational reason why he said he Bear Stearns and didn't say Lehman Brothers, therefore this is personal. You want to create ambiguity, create ambiguity. Now what's scary is here's a non-elected politician it has this incredible power to make those kind of arbitrary decisions and dole out favors to one company and not to another. And in Bear Stearns' case, remember, they also saved the shareholders of Bear Stearns. Another interesting case, AIG, you probably heard about AIG, the largest insurance company in the world, uh, was basically taken over by the U.S. government. Uh, AIG is an interesting company. They, their traditional insurance business it's very sound. My company, BBT, we're the sixth largest insurance program in the world. We do a lot of business with AIG and their insurance operations for sound. They had in their parent company a very interesting su su uh, subsidiary that did something called credit default swaps. So these are basically insurance policies. That's not technically right, but it's the idea of insurance policies on bonds. Well, the, 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 there were big default rates in these bonds, and AIG had whopping losses potentially in those insurance policies. Uh, they could have easily spun off that subsidiary and taken the losses in their, in their insurance business would have been fine. However, the government chose to quote, save AIG, uh, which is very questionable because it's an interesting question whether they actually needed saving, but they, they chose to save them, uh, wiped out all the shareholders in that process, and, and there's no way you can get a systems issue except AIG's biggest counterparty was Goldman Sachs. And uh, Paulson had spent his career at Goldman Sachs. Uh, he had $500 million worth of Goldman Sachs. Everybody at Treasury worked for Goldman Sachs. Uh, it's easy to be objectively believe that if Goldman Sachs goes, they're so big, they're going to take out the rest of the financial system. Therefore, we have to save AIG to save Goldman Sachs. Now, Goldman claimed they had hedged that risk. And also, if Goldman had gone broke, I think it would have been a good day, you're speaking for me, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Interesting how that all happens. I mean, one more story and then a closing thoughts. When I was uh, involved in this financial crisis, my company was doing very well. We didn't have a, we didn't have a single quarterly loss. Uh, very well relative to the world we were in. There were a couple other large banks in the same category, and we wanted to meet with Bernanke, who headed the Federal Reserve, and Paulson, 
and a guy named Geithner, who was uh, running the New York Fed, who were kind of running this rescue operation. Every day, they were talking to large financial institutions that were in the process of failing. They refused to meet with the health institutions. And it's a very interesting thing to reflect on how, how that whole process works, that whole process. Um, I have a cure. I'm not an attorney, but I'm going to tell you a cure. I know it's radical, but it's also simple at the same time. And I, I'll offer you two cures. Um, not being an attorney, I, I have read the Constitution several times, though. And it's really clear to me that, that the, if you read the Constitution, uh, there's something called an enumerated powers. There are 14 things that Congress can do, and there have been a few things added in the amendments to the Constitution. In that list of things Congress can do, there's nothing mentioned about Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. I don't know where that came from. Uh, uh, it, as long as the government is involved in these things, those and favors are the favors going to be, uh, be given out. Why don't we go back to the enumerated powers? And I know the argument is always the Commerce Clause. However, if you read what Madison said in the Commerce Clause, that was just to keep states from penalizing companies in other states. What about if the government, that's all they did in the Commerce Clause? Um, I got another proposal. I know this is radical. You know, one of the really foundations in the United States is the separation of church and state. I don't think we'd be here as a country we are if we hadn't separated church and state. We couldn't have had the diversity and integration. How about separating commerce and state? Why not a constitutional amendment that says, hey, the government can't dole out favors to crony capitalists? It's against the Constitution. It can't be done. Uh, radical solutions, however, crony capitalism has very negative consequences. First, it reduces our standard of living and materially over a long period of time. It keeps business in business that shouldn't be in business, that are not economically efficient. It subsidizes projects that won't be, shouldn't be done. Ethanol being the classic example, we're starving people on the planet by raising corn prices to, to make an environmentally destructive product. If you look at crony capitalism, the reason that the, the crony part is necessary is because it shouldn't be done. Markets wouldn't allow it to allocate resources in that way. City groups should have failed back in 1975, and we wouldn't be talking about some of the mistakes they've made since then. Uh, secondly, it creates a sense of injustice. You know, in the banking industry, I see that. I see you know, as community banks were allowed to fail, and large financial institutions got bailed out. There's a real sense of injustice about that. And the average Joe gets that. He may not know it in detail, but that creates a, a, a lack of confidence in, in our whole society when there's those kind of injustices. Um, and, and, and crony capitalism, I think, undermines market capitalism, real free markets in this way. People see that large companies, specialty companies, are getting favors. And they say, well, you know, there's something wrong with capitalism. They think of crony capitalism and capitalism. It is not. It is crony statism. And they think in terms of that crony statism as capitalism, and therefore they pass lots of laws, rules, and regulations. And my company did very well through the financial crisis. We didn't have a single quarterly loss, and we kept it to, to deal with Dodd-Frank. And Dodd-Frank is really a, re, a reaction to the terrific bad idea of bailing out a lot of large number of financial institutions. And if the government's going to have to bail institutions out, therefore it has to super regulate them. And so the good companies get punished by the sins of the bad. That's what crony capitalism, crony statism looks like in the real world. I'll share with you one last thought. This is from my perspective as a libertarian. Um, I know this is not exactly the case, but I think it's, there's an argument for this. I mean, I think of the founding fathers and the, and the legal system and governmental system they were trying to design, I believe that they fundamentally view the role of government as protection of individual rights. The government was really about keeping me from using force or fraud to take what was yours and keeping you from using force or fraud to take what was mine. And that government had a very important but very limited role. National defense to keep the bad guys from overseas from getting us. Police to keep the bad guys here from getting us. A very effective court system. Uh, which would be much more evolved through common law instead of regulatory law, a lot less regulations and a lot more court-based decision-making so we could settle legitimate disputes without using force. I think that's what they intended the government to do. And when they talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, 
I think they were serious about that. They were serious about people's moral right to their own life. People's moral right to the product of their labor. If they produce a lot, they get a lot, and they get to choose whether or not to give it away, who to give it away to. And also serious about the pursuit of happiness. And they understood that really to pursue happiness, you had to take responsibility for your life, you had to take personal responsibility, and you had to be free to pursue what you believe is right. And I think of it, not so much in terms of the CEO of Exxon, but I think of it as a brick there. Guy has a very, very tough, hard life. He gets something precious from his hard work. He gets the, the, the pride of, uh, of achievement from that kind of work. But most important, uh, I think bricklayers and productive people want to live in a society where they can pursue their happiness based on their fundamental beliefs, based on their values as a free and independent person. And I think that's what the rule of government is, not to do, deal out favors to their friends. Thank you very much. Right? I mean, it's... <laughs> um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about boundary issues. One of the problems I have with the phrase crony capitalism is that I actually tried to look up on Westlaw and some newspaper articles to see how much or what it is that people were referring to. And I realized that it just was used for every single variety of corporate things I don't like. Right? It's called crony capitalism, things you don't like. So, embezzlement, uh, maybe, outright bribery, um, theft, all were labeled cronyism. Sometimes these are other things that we all consider are bad things, but I just want to distinguish, they're not necessarily cronyism, but they're called cronyism, you see in these articles. There are other things that are called cronyism, Corporations are becoming too powerful, right? They have much more influence in the government than an interest group that I like. That's called cronyism. What is the interest group that you like? Oh, you prefer the ACLU to have more power than the, than the American Chamber of Commerce. But the American Chamber of Commerce has much more and it seems to get its way. Crony capitalism, right? All kinds of things. And one problem is that once a definition becomes that flexible and malleable, you can get all things shoved underneath it. And cronyism is a very, very malleable and opaque concept. It's more opaque, in my view, than corruption, which is pretty opaque. And corruption is more opaque than outright bribery, which in itself is somewhat opaque. And as lawyers, if you ever have to deal with institutional design, future law students, future lawyers, you have to deal with the boundary problem, right? Whenever you have triac, I'm sorry, I'm bringing up old things. Everybody remember this, the rules, you have to have the thesis, the rule, right? Am I, am I hitting something? Rule, rule explanation, application to the rule, right? Certain things have to fit in and certain things have to be out. A judge, a lawyer, everybody has to define where the boundaries are. So what are the boundaries of cronyism? How do we know when something is cronyism and when it isn't? It may be even something worse. It may be something better. But how do we draw those lines? And I say this in part because I looked at the, 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 the panel invitation and it said something to the effect that if you look at the left, the left is against it. And if you look at the right, the right is against it. But you've got to make sure that what you claim you're against is even the same thing. Because if it isn't, you may find out, uh, and Federalist 10 has a very good example of this, that when you try to control factions, Right? And you put institutions in place that assume that you can displace a certain kind of behavior, you may end up with a cure that is worse than the disease. And let me give you a sense of why it is tricky here because we started with the definition. And I think the judge hit it right on the back of Jones that this has to do with something like 
giving favors to your friends. Crony comes from the word cronius, and it usually means in the Greek long-standing. In the 19th century, if it were used in the United States and you said somebody was a crony, it would actually not necessarily have a negative implication. It just means my long-standing friend, my crony. The negative implication of cronyism actually comes up in place with during the Truman administration. This is when cronyism starts to have its negative effect. Why? Because newspaper articles at the time had said, look, you, Truman, have staffed all these important positions with people who just were merely your friends from Missouri. We don't see what their qualifications are. They're your cronies. This is the beginning of the negative vision of cronyism. Now, when you think of it this way, friends who have nothing to do or not qualified for a certain position, it has a family semblance to other things that we understand, like tribalism and nepotism. Putting in associates, privileged associates, friends, into positions that you don't think that what, that, that, that they are unable or are incapable of performing. It just has to do with the fact that they're related to you in a certain way. When you think of it this way, this is different, and I'll get to in a moment, from interest group politics as we normally understand it. Now, how would this play out? How would you see something that looks like cronyism, right, that is clearly well defined, at, right, and, and look at things that we think are like cronyism but are not cronyism? I'll give you a classic example of this teach at a law school. And imagine that a dean tried to hire a professor, right? And the dean wants to give an offer to the professor. And you say, dean, what's going on? Now, this person hasn't written anything, right? And they haven't taught anything. And the dean says, well, this person was my friend. And they used to play soccer together, right? And I trust your judgment because he was a very good and honest soccer player. At that stage, you look in and say, well, Dean, what does a good and honest soccer player have to do with being a professor at a law school or at a university? It is that disconnect. This person means something special to me. I'm well connected to that, right? There we, that's classic kind of cronyism. When people accuse cronyism of the Asian financial crisis and its rule in the 1990s, what they're saying is, look, there are these Asian banks that were extending credit to people merely because they had personal relationships with them, friends, not because of their risk, not because of the business plans they had. It had something that nothing to do with business. It had something to do with their friendship. Now, Having understood it that way, you'll discover that certain times the lines have to get blurred. Now let's move one step further. Let's assume that I'm a well-connected faculty candidate, and I have friends in Congress, and I know a lot of big bankers. And the dean looks over at me and says, I would like to hire you because maybe you can get those bankers to give us money. Now the dean is thinking not of his own personal relationship, but of the whole law school, how to improve it. The problem is that we're now moving a little bit to what looks like public interest, but it's not quite there because even if I can get the money for the law school, my job definition as a professor is that I should teach research, not necessarily get money for the law school. So again, my connections, my background, my kinships, the people I know should probably not play that role, right? This is a little bit cronyistic, but it still isn't classic cronyism. Now, third phase, let's imagine you're trying to hire a dean or president of the university. They come in and say, I'm well connected. I know the governor of Texas. I know the top bankers of the world. Every single faculty member will say, hooray, right? That's what we want in a president of the university. That's what you want in a dean. You want somebody who's well connected, who knows the people, who can get the money because much of what they do is fundraising. And fundraising has to do with being well connected, knowing how to make friends, knowing how to reach out. So one activity that is classic cronyism when it's played by a professor or something like that becomes less of cronyism when it's done by another actor because it's part of the actor's defined role. It has something to do with the roles that we play. And if it's not fitting in with what you're supposed to do, we think it's cronyism because we think it distorts. Now, let me give you an example in the political system of how this plays out. 
If I come from Chicago and I'm a company and I go to my congressman or congresswoman and I say, Congressman, this bill that you're about to pass may not help us. My company serves the people of Chicago. I hire a lot of people in Chicago. And that bill that you're about to pass will not help us. And because my company serves a lot of the people in Chicago, a lot of the people in Chicago will be disappointed with you if you pass that bill, right? The company is just conveying, right, what its interests are. It's saying, I'm in Chicago. It is trying to convey to the congressperson, this is important for us. This, by the way, is not cronyism. This is actually what we usually call representative democracy, right? A lot of your members of Congress who do that, by the way. And they can do it in, in this fashion. They can say, you know what, Mr. Congressman, this bill will help us. It will help us in Chicago. And by the way, it may hurt my competitors in Texas. And the congressman goes in and does that and passes the bill. That is still right, representative democracy. And it's existed ever since this country. And almost, they do it in Denmark. They do it here. There's no place where that doesn't happen. It's part and parcel of what it means to be representative democracy. But here is where cronyism comes in. You come up to me. I'm from Chicago. I'm the company in Chicago. I'm speaking to a member of my, my congressperson. And the congressperson says, look, um, I say to the congressman, I want you to do something for me. I want you to pass a bill. A member of Congress turns to me and says, well, I want you to do something for me. And I said, what do you want me to do, congressperson? I can help with your election. And the congressman says, no, not quite that. I want you to appoint two of my golfing buddies to the board of your company. Does everybody see how this differs from the first transaction, where the congressperson say, help me pass legislation, and I said, I can help. I can ask my folks to vote for you if you pass the legislation. My workers will be happy with you. This is different from the congressperson saying, I want you to appoint my buddy to your board. Because two things come into place, right? As a matter of what the congressperson's job is, we think that Congress people can pass legislation. We also think that part of their job and what they try to do is run for election. We don't necessarily think that what their job should be or part of their job performance is putting in friends and affiliates and relatives on the board of corporations. We think that the congressperson is now leveraging their power to get something that seems a little bit suspicious. And from the company's perspective, it's also not good because having relatives or congresspersons or congressmen, right, or their friends on my board without knowing what the performance levels of these people are is not good for my business. So we have two things that look like dead weight loss. Me choosing incompetent people, people have no idea about their qualifications to serve on my board just to please a congressperson, and the congressperson not seeking something out of me that has to do with their re-election, but to, to play favor to somebody they know. This kind of activity is what you would call the classic model of what you call cronyism. The boundary problem is that we sometimes confuse the first with the second. When the left often complains about cronyism, what it's trying to say is something of this nature. Those people who make money have too much power. Those people like the American Chamber of Commerce have too much power in our political system. Some other groups seeking non-economic goals should have more power. We should change the system a little bit. This is very classic. Larry Lessig brings up, uh, this up in his book about uh, copyright. Those business people have too much power and they, they influence copyright policy in a way that I don't like. We need to increase the power of these nonprofits and groups that I'm affiliated with. We need something like campaign finance to change the balance. That has nothing to do with cronyism. That's just interest group politics. You may not like the fact that sometimes interest group politics means inequality in access. But inequality of access is also the future of almost every single modern democracy. I didn't say 18th century. I didn't say some since. Since, by the way, this idea of everybody having equal access may have to go back to Athens before you see something like that. Wherever there are factions and organization, and you can overcome collective action and it gives you a benefit, you have unequal access. That's just a fact of life. And sometimes it may be correlated with your resources, and sometimes it may not be. 
A very classic example of this. If you're an African-American interest group or an African-American political lobby, you may have more power than an Asian-American political lobby. It's not because you have more money. It's because maybe you're better organized and can overcome your collective action problems. Nothing to do with cronyism. It's how we access the system. You may not like inequality of access, but don't call that cronyism. Now, from the right, one of the concerns that you see from the right is that they say, look, people who try to compete in business should compete in the marketplace. They shouldn't compete in the government world. They should use government to compete. All the competition should take place in the marketplace. To a certain degree, that's all fine and dandy. And sometimes in the back of our mind, we say, we have somebody like Steve Jobs in mind. We say, why can't all business people be like this person? He tries to be innovative. He doesn't go asking Obama for favors. He doesn't hang out with the congressperson. He just does business, creates things that people like, and sells them. The problem with that argument, I would say, is that not all business structures are the same. Think about it this way. If you're Steve Jobs, and you met Obama, or even the president of Mexico, and you're sitting around, maybe you met up in Davos, and they come up to you and say, we want to help you, Steve. We want to help Apple. The fact is, I don't even know if Steve Jobs can figure out a way that Obama can be of assistance to him. What will Obama do that will make him richer? It's unclear. It doesn't work well with that business model. It doesn't work well with software. It doesn't work without that business model. But assume that you're an oil company. By the nature of how oil businesses run, the environmental regulations that govern it, the fact that company, that states usually have some kind of proprietary interest in the land where, where this oil is being drilled, you have to be sometimes in a relationship with government actors. Let me give you a classic example of how this would work. There is in Houston, for those of you in Texas, there used to be a chartered one-week flight that would go from Houston to a place called Malabo. Those of you who don't know, Malabo is an obscure little town in Equatorial Guinea, off the West African coast. And you're like, why do we have a direct flight? There are no direct flights anywhere from Houston to any place in Africa. Why Malabo? Well, Malabo, right, had a per capita income in 1998 of $540. In 2004, its per capita income was $5,600. 540 to 5600 is one of the largest increases of GDP ever in recorded human history within that time, six years. What happened? Oil, right? And here's the interesting thing. Nobody has figured out how do you make money in Equatorial Guinea if Teodoro Mbasogo, the president of Equatorial Guinea, does not like you. No one oil company has figured that out. None. If you're Boeing, right, it behooves you if you're going to sell planes, right, that you make sure if the king of Saudi Arabia cracks any joke that you smile. Because why? Saudi Arabia has an airline called Saudi, which is still owned by the Saudi government. The United Arab Emirates has its Arab Emirates. These are airlines that actually buy planes, right? And it's very difficult to figure out how you can sell planes to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia if the king really doesn't like you. It is the business model. And if you're the president of Boeing, to be a good business person, you have to care. That is because the nature of the business that they have means that they interact with government agents. A government contract or a defense contract who sells stuff to government agents has to care about what the government feels. It's not the same business model as Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, their business model is different. And I'll just say something about Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Bill Gates used to have the view that I am a capitalist. I make things that people like, and I don't hang out with government people, right? In the late 1990s, the government says, we want to hang out with you. <laughs> we want to take your company and break it up into millions of small parts, right? And and Gates turned around and said, well, wait, can they do that? He's received a subpoena that says you have a deposition. In the District of Columbia, they says they can. And since the late 1990s, Microsoft has decided it has to set up an office in Washington, D.C., take out members of Congress to lunch on occasion and to dinner, right? 
Why? Not because it was seeking a government favor, but sometimes the government will come to you. Now, I just, <laughs> and it behooves Bill Gates to try to understand that, right? Now, all I'm just trying to say is that all of this has to do with how we understand the framework of cronyism and interaction. Now, it is still the case that if you take away the antitrust problems that Microsoft was facing, that for the most part, it doesn't usually operate with the government's aid, and it doesn't need the government's aid. But one thing I have to understand, and we admire that business model, but it is the business model for Microsoft. It won't work with a lot of business models. If you're still an oil company executive, it behooves you to know how to deal with political leaders all over the world, because a lot of the places where oil is being drilled are not places where they just say, you're a good business person and that's enough. They want to, they want a little bit under, they want to know you a little bit more, right? And that's just the nature of it. We can try to deal with some of the problems that come up from there, but we should be aware of our limitations. And that's it. Society and uh, um, uh, uh, Marie Halter, Colin White, and Alex Hughes of the local chapter of uh, uh, the Federal Society for this opportunity to be with you. Uh, I'm a simple, uh, I retire academic, and so I have to start with very simple things like trying to understand the various isms. First, what is socialism? You have two cows, state takes one and gives it to someone else. Communism. You have two cows, state takes both of them and gives you milk. Capitalism, ah, the genius of capitalism. You have two cows, you sell one and buy a bull. <laughs> but there are at least two different variations of capitalism that are troublesome. First, there's a mockery of capitalism flowing from mischief uh, in the private sector, you have two cows. You sell three of them to your publicly listed company, <laughs> using letters of credit owned by your brother-in-law at the bank, then execute a debt equity swap with an associated general offer that you get four cows back with a tax deduction for keeping five cows. The milk rights of, of six That's cows the milk rights of six cows are transferred by a Panamanian intermediary to a Cayman Islands company secretly owned by the majority shareholder who sells the rights to all seven cows milk back to the listed company. The annual report claims that you own eight cows with an option on one more. <laughs> Meanwhile, the two cows you actually own have died because you couldn't afford feeding them. <laughs> and then second, there's the mockery of capitalism uh, that flows largely from mischief over in the public sector. At least in the minds of some members of the public, uh, this is so pervasive and so disturbing that it deserves a name. Crony capitalism, the, the subject of this panel. My own, my own remarks will focus on one of the issues, merely one of the issues associated with this subject, and talk about uh, a possible strategy that I previously outlined in an article last year for addressing this issue. To be more specific, uh, in terms of the issue, the specific issue, uh, I want to focus on the extent to which uh, the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve have seen fit to intervene, the extent to which they have seen fit to intervene in markets on the grounds of, in the interest of, financial stability. Uh, warranted or not, uh, those who believe there's been uh, too much crony capitalism often look in the area of bailouts, special deals, and other governmental responses to the global financial crisis that emerged, that came to a head uh, in September 2008. And in terms of the possible strategy for dealing 
with uh, this issue that might help in some small way is basically to try to, in effect, arbitrage difference, arbitrage in a very loose sense, arbitrage differences in objectives and philosophies of different components of the federal government. Uh, the, these different components of the federal government have very different objectives. Uh, the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve are very focused on financial stability, especially short-term financial stability and other aspects of systemic risk. Uh, in contrast, certain other components of the federal government, at least as a relative matter, are far more focused on the proper operation of a capitalist economy. That is, for instance, at the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, the focus historically has not been on financial stability, but instead on the operation of a well-informed, uh, the operation of well-informed markets. That well-informed markets, not the government, would make uh, the decisions about the pricing of assets and about the allocation of real economic resources. The overarching philosophy of the SEC since the SEC's creation uh, in the 1930s has been of a highly incremental form of government intervention. Disclosure. Uh, merely to that the role of government merely or primarily is to ensure a robust informational foundation for private decision makers. The SEC would not generally venture beyond the realm of information to that of substantive decision making so that, uh, for instance, the nature and characteristics of the securities offered, the relationships between the underwriters and the issuers, and the securities offerings pricing, uh, securities offering price and the trading prices were left to participants and overall market forces. And in terms of the uh, strategy, as I'll describe in a little bit, focuses on, in a sense, taking advantage of these differences. If we can, in effect, move power away, power and influence away from components of the federal government uh, who are some who may arguably sometimes be too focused on financial stability to other components of the federal government that are more focused on the proper operation of free markets that perhaps some aspects of crony capitalism, some aspects of uh, capitalism could operate better. And let me use a quick illustration. On September 18, 2008, uh, at the height of the global financial crisis, the SEC suddenly decided to ban, prohibit all short selling in the securities of financial firms. This was unprecedented. The SEC had never issued a flat prohibition of short selling uh, in the U.S. in its entire 75-year history. And this September 2008 action was also diametrically opposed to the SEC's approach throughout the modern era to increasingly move away from the old uptick rule that had limited, in certain ways, short selling. Uh, and as a side note, I should emphasize that um, what I'm talking about in terms of the September 08 uh, uh, decision was before I went to the SEC. So I'm basing everything I'm saying on public, completely publicly available information. Now, let's get a little bit more granular in terms of the September 08 decision and in terms of the old limitation that the SEC had on short selling. In 1938, that is well before modern finance emerged. 
Uh, the SEC adopted the former 10A1 to restrict short selling in a declining market, what's sometimes referred to as the uptick rule. The central notion was to basically allow short selling when markets were rising, but to prevent short selling in a declining market, and especially to prevent those who are conducting so-called bear raids on stocks uh, from accelerating a market decline. When sh sh shares are falling, the SEC would <coughs> limit some short selling. But this uptick rule remained virtually unchanged for nearly 70 years. Nearly unchanged for 70 years. But over time, as financial science took hold, emerged and took hold, um, to make clearer and clearer, clearer and clearer, that this kind of market intervention uh, was a bad idea. The SEC moved increasingly to lessen the effect of the uptick rule, for instance, by granting various exemptions. And indeed, in 2004, the SEC temporarily suspended the uptick rule as a certain securities so that they could do a pilot study, an empirical study, as the impact of getting rid of the rule. They found, basically, that that rule made no sense. And in 2007, the SEC abolished the uptick rule, limiting short selling. Now, that was in 2007. Then a nearly unprecedented period of market turmoil, turmoil started occurring, concurrent with the sudden word subprime mortgage and credit crisis. The events of September 08 were especially troubling. And as you might know, as you might remember, on September 15, Lehman Holdings uh, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The next day, the Fed saved AIG from collapse with the initial $85 billion loan. And then that run started in the reserve primary uh, fund, the first money market fund in, in our country, a large money market fund that had invested heavily in Lehman paper. And then a run started on money market funds worldwide. On September 18th, Fed Chairman Bernanke met privately with congressional leaders in favor of the TARP bill, the Troubled Asset Recovery uh, Program uh, bill, warning of the possibility of another Great Depression, one much worse than that of the 1930s. That same day, September 18th, the SEC issued the emergency order prohibiting short selling in publicly traded securities of, quote, financial institutions. The SEC referred to the continued potential of sudden and excessive fluctuations of securities prices and disruption in a functioning securities market that could threaten uh, fair and orderly markets. Three days later, the SEC effectively delegated, uh, allowed the exchanges to determine if a firm was material, and almost a thousand companies Companies like CBS Caremark, IBM, and General Motors all got to be designated financial companies. So that way you could short sell those companies. This September 08 order was stunning in both substance and in terms of process. In terms of substance, in terms of substance, uh, this prohibition ran directly counter to the general social science driven SEC effort to move away from short selling restrictions. Uh, indeed, uh, the last time that, and in terms of how dramatic it was, an outright prohibition, the last time there was a short selling prohibition uh, in the US was in 1931, before the SEC had even been created. Now, in terms of the process, that led to its adoption, essentially, exaggerating only slightly, there was no process. Number one, the SEC offered absolutely no opportunity for public comment, uh, complete contrast to the ordinary notice and comment process. 
Uh, second, they mandated that this extraordinary order go into effect immediately. Third, the emergency order was all of five pages completely bereft of any economic analysis. And indeed, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, this, the question inevitably arises, um, what caused this? What uh, caused the SEC to undertake you know, what was really a kind of a stunning move uh, and one in such, uh, uh, that was adopted in such peculiar circumstances? Publicly available information suggests that among the reasons, I don't mean to suggest necessarily it was a dominant reason, but publicly available data suggests that among the reasons was outside pressure brought to bear on the SEC. In the congressional testimony a week after the, uh, after the ban, uh, then SEC Chairman Chris Rick Cox referred to the ban in his congressional testimony as, quote, highly unusual and a very difficult one for the SEC, uh, that it was taken, quote, with the support of and in coordination with Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson and Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke. And then in December 08, just shortly before SEC uh, Chairman Christopher Cox decided to return to California, he gave an interview to the Washington Post. He referred to the ban as the biggest mistake of his tenure. He said in his newspaper interview that he was under heavy pressure from Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson and Federal Reserve Chairman Bernanke to take this action, and he did so only reluct reluctantly. Other public reports have suggested that Wall Street heavyweights had lobbied both Paulson uh, and Treasury Secretary Geithner to put pressure on the SEC to adopt the prohibition. Uh, in, uh, for instance, uh, one report suggests that in a private conversation with Secretary Paulson, uh, the head of one major uh, Wall Street firm uh, 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 said to Paulson, quote, you have to approach what you're doing from the perspective of being a sheriff in a western town where things are out of control. And you have to do the equivalent of just walking down on, onto Main Street and shooting your gun up in the air uh, to a few times to establish you're in charge. The first thing you ought to do is stop short selling of financial institutions. Forget whether it, it's uh, effective in removing the pressure, although it might. What will be accomplished is that you uh, will scare the participants in the market. Uh, so if one were to, uh, prone to exaggerate, uh, one would characterize that the scene from a million Western movies sufficed for economic justification. <laughs> In fact, the Treasury and the Fed, to be fair, uh, the Treasury and the Fed were not the only people putting pressure on the SEC. Politicians, uh, uh, members of Congress, and one, you know, a uh, presidential candidate, uh, one major presidential candidate, said that he would fire Chairman Cox uh, if he became president because he had betrayed the public trust, because he had abolished the uptick rule. Now, um, the goals of the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department are different from the uh, traditional goals of the SEC. Uh, the Fed and the Treasury have as primary goals the financial stability of markets, the soundness of financial services firms, especially in the short term. The SEC's primary goal is more long-term in nature and more diffuse, uh, ensuring uh, efficient, fully informed financial markets driven not by government actions, but by decision makers in the private sphere. The SEC realizes, has historically realized, that dynamic nature of such markets 
will sometimes cause short-term pain, but that may, the, may be the price one pays to have efficient markets and efficient allocation of resources in a capitalist system. One strategy for moving away from such a focus on financial stability and toward more of a focus on the proper operation of markets may be to try to en enhance the power and influence of the more market-driven SEC relative to the more stability-driven Fed and Treasury. In terms of how to implement this strategy, um, at least in theory, at least, sorry, at least back in 2008, in theory, uh, the SEC had full jurisdiction over the issue in terms of short selling. And there are, regulat there are independent regulatory agencies. The SEC chairman did not report to Bernanke or Geithner. But in practice, rather different. First, the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve tend to be the primary government actors uh, in economic issues, and therefore more powerful than the SEC. I'm not the least to suggesting uh, we change that. Uh, so that's not a way of, in a sense, uh, trying to reallocate power, if you will, a little bit within the federal government. But there are some ways in which could contribute to implementing this kind of strategy. Uh, for instance, in terms of the power of the purse, the bargaining, the leverage that the Treasury and the Fed have relative to the SEC stem in part from the fact that the SEC depends uh, entirely for its funding on appropriations from Congress. The President, through his recommendations as to what the SEC budget uh, should be, together with Congress, have the power of the purse over the SEC. In terms of, and to the President and to Congress, matters of short-term stability and soundness uh, are more concrete and especially in times of concrete, uh, of crisis, far more emphatic than the, the subtle logic associated with unruly workings of efficient markets. So one possible way of addressing this issue is to take away the leverage that the President and the Treasury, the Congress, have over the SEC in terms of the purse that the SEC has, for decades, tried to get what's referred to as self-funding. In effect, that the SEC gets to keep the fees it collects. Uh, tradic the SEC basically makes money for the federal government. It collects far more in fees than it's, it has in terms of its budget. If there's self-funding, in terms of it gets to keep the fees it has, uh, the kinds of leverage that the Treasury, the, uh, the executive, and Congress have over the SEC will be substantially diminished. Uh, I'll not uh, go into the problem, some of the sorry, weaknesses to giving uh, this kind of self-funding to the uh, SEC. There's also a new fact at work, uh, post Dodd Frank, which actually, believe it or not, exacerbates the problem. That is, in fact, diminishes uh, the relative importance and influence of the SEC with respect to financial stability. And that's because Dodd-Frank created the Financial Stability Oversight Council. The chairman of the Financial Stability Oversight Council is a Treasury Secretary. Other members of the council include Fed Chairman Bernanke, the SEC uh, Chairman, CFTC Chairman, uh, and the like. With these 10 voting members, they are supposed to respond to, quote, emerging threats to the stability of the US financial system. As a statutory matter now, the SEC chairman must explicitly consider stability. Let me conclude. A joke on the streets of Moscow uh, in the first few years uh, after Gorbachev 
went this way. Everything the communists told us about communism, sorry, everything uh, the communists uh, told us about, uh, uh, yeah, everything the communists told us about capitalism was a complete and utter lie. Unfortunately, everything the communists told us about capitalism turned out to be true. Not enough can be said about the genius of capitalism. Joseph Schumpeter in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy stated, the fundamental impulse that sets and keeps a capitalist engine in motion comes from the new consumers, goods, the new methods of production or transportation, the new markets, the new forms of industrial organization that the capitalist enterprise creates. Capitalism depends on change, on innovation, on the utmost respect for market prices and market allocation of economic resources, even if the markets are, can be unruly. In rethinking the actual operation of capitalism today, we should at least consider the reallocation, some kind of reallocation of power and influence from those components of the federal government more focused on short-term financial stability to those components of the federal government more focused on the virtues of dynamic, unruly, well-informed markets. Uh, this would promote, uh, in the interest of the instrumental value of such markets and the legitimacy that such markets would have. Thank you very much. Great to be here again in Austin and to share this uh, atmosphere of uh, liberty that uh, from a blue state like Connecticut I, I sometimes uh, direly miss. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, crony capitalism from a slightly different perspective uh, than uh, my colleagues on, on the panel. Uh, not, I'm, I'm not going to address it really from a, from a normative uh, perspective but just kind of from a, from a, a descriptive uh, uh, perspective, I'm going to begin by embracing, I think, the definition that um, uh, uh, we began the evening with, that is crony capitalism essentially is uh, a, uh, a, uh, an environment in uh, the uh, business world and in the world of government in which uh, pursuing government favors and obtaining government favors uh, it is, is part of everyday life, and, uh, uh, and, and the notions of meritocracy have been displaced by notions of, uh, of uh, cronyism or kleptocracy or something of that form. And we can think about this from a historical perspective and sort of ask ourselves the question, well, you know, the U.S. has been around now for a couple centuries, so where are we? You know, and, and crony capitalism, as I'll explain, I hope, uh, has kind of ebbed and flowed in our history, um, and it seems as though, and the reason I think this is a nice topic that uh, the Federalist Society folks here at Texas uh, selected is, seems to be a little bit on the rise. Um, uh, and I'm, you know, just looking at the, sort of the last couple months, one could talk for hours about the examples of crony capitalism, uh, the $78 million tax write-off in the, uh, in the, a new tax bill for NASCAR drivers. That may be very popular, uh, I don't know, but, but it's, it's crony capitalism. Uh, the one I like, I'm, I'm in favor of this one, the, there was a $222 million rebat, rebate for distillers of, of rum, which uh, uh, I think is not a bad thing, maybe. Uh, <laughs> the the uh, tax, uh, tax benefits for the New York Liberty Zone for uh, companies operating in uh, American Samoa to uh, companies that are, thanks to Chris Dodd, the former Connecticut, I'm ashamed to say, a senator who uh, now represents Hollywood's movie studios who uh, got uh, a tax victory in the form of an, a two-year extension on a provision allowing film and television producers to expense the first $15 million of production costs 
incurred in the United States. So kind of uh, wholesale crony capitalism. A couple of other ones, you know, uh, Jack Lew two days ago was just confirmed by the Senate as our new uh, Secretary of the, of the Treasury. Um, uh, and one of the, the striking thing about, about, one of the striking things about Jack Lew, other than the fact that he's has no experience in finance or in qualifications. <laughs> <laughs> he had a contract when he worked at Citibank. He kind of did some administrative work with a hedge fund there. And his contract said that he would receive a bonus uh, if he were appointed, if and only if he were appointed to a senior position in government. And I was teaching a, a class yesterday uh, at Yale Law School, and a student said, so what do you think about this? Uh, I don't know if someone's here, people just say whatever's on their mind randomly uh, in there. And, and I said, well, uh, you know, bribery is illegal. Uh, but apparently prospective bribery uh, is okay. Uh, so as long as you, if you buy the futures contract, it's not the same thing as the <laughs> Well, you know, I, I think that's such a good idea. Now, it, it, there, but, but that's done. This guy's been confirmed. Next coming down the road is a, a very distinguished lawyer, partner in the law firm of Debbie Boyce and Plimpton, uh, Mary Jill White, uh, who is uh, uh, our president's uh, nominee for uh, the chairman of the SEC, to be the chair of the, of the SEC. And uh, while at Debbie Boyce, um, one of the clients that Mary Jo represented was the uh, investment banking firm Morgan Stanley. So we've been picking on Goldman Sachs, and not, no, I'm happy to do that. But we'll talk about Morgan Stanley for a minute. So Morgan Stanley's board of directors has decided that uh, this fellow John Mack would be a good person to 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 uh, put in the job of uh, CEO, chief of, uh, executive officer of, of Morgan Stanley. But there was a problem, which there have been a few articles in the newspapers about a possible problem that John might have with um, an obscure part of the uh, federal securities regulation, uh, outlawing insider trading. And so, uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, Mary Jo's client, uh, Morgan Stanley, called up and said, Mary Jo, you know, it would be embarrassing for us if we nominated elected uh, as CEO, uh, John Mack, and then you were sued for, for securities fraud uh, the next day. So can you help us out here just see what the lay of the land is? So Mary Jo picks up the phone. This is our current novel. And she calls up the head of the Enforcement Division of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Linda Chapman Thompson. She says, Linda. I, this is kind of appealing to me. It's a girl power thing, I suppose. But calls up and says, uh, how do things look? How, what's the legal landscape look like for uh, for my client John Mack? Uh, you know, if you guys are going to assume anything, I really need to know. Now, for those of us who study the enforcement process of the SEC, there are at any one time thousands of people who are begging the SEC for information about if and when, uh, uh, if and when uh, they, they'll uh, the SEC will, will finish investigations or reach a conclusion. Just yesterday, or sorry, two days ago, the U.S. Supreme Court nine did nothing. I'm thrilled to say, uh, uh, ruled against the Securities Exchange Commission in a case called a Gabelli against SEC, where the SEC was essentially ruling, was essentially arguing to abolish the statute of limitations that would apply to it in securities cases, and and the uh, Supreme Court happily said, so no, but but so so. Mary Jo, you know, this is, this is a little bit of corruption. Mary Jo, of course, gets her answer. Linda's no longer the, the uh, head of the enforcement division of the SEC. She's a partner at Davis Polk and, and Wardwell uh, in, in New York. So we have a lot of crony capitalism. Um, I think it is just uh, uh, absolutely clear that, um, you know, if, you, if one thinks about this, again, just from a descriptive point of view, um, the, the supply and demand of crony capitalism is a, a situation where, uh, where when the conditions are right for crony capitalism, it's going to emerge and even dominate. You know? so, so that is to say uh, that crony capitalism involves a, a demand side, which is the demand of people like uh, Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or these very rum distilleries or whatever for legislative things. And the supply comes from the bureaucrats and elected officials 
who uh, who are asked to supply this, and, um, and, and 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 that's just the intellectual reality. And the question, you know, comes it becomes depressing because it becomes kind of like the rain. Uh, you know, everybody talks about it, but what can you what can you do about it? Um, and so the point that I want to make is simply that um, as the amount of regulation in the economy uh, increases, and as the amount of competition in the economy decreases, then you're able, you're, one is going to get more crony capitalism. You know, it's kind of a moral story, but it's really not a moral story. Because both our po elected political officials and our business people operate in Darwinian environments in which the, uh, the, 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 in which not everybody survives. And that the process will weed out uh, people with weaker survival characteristics and the people and firms and legislators with better survival characteristics will, will, uh, will um, do better. And, and this explains both the rise of crony capitalism and the decline of crony capitalism. But let me let me give you an example of a of, a, of the what I think is the, the 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 biggest single instance of a decline in crony capitalism uh, in the history of the United States. And that is uh, toward the end of the 19th century. Many of you who've taken business organizations as law students are aware of this. If you wanted to start a business, if you want to start a company uh, in the United States. Uh, you had to have a, as a corporation, you had to have a charter. But you couldn't, you would, one would go to, uh, uh, one would go to, uh, there, there was no, none of the current rules for uh, obtaining a corporate charter. Uh, rather, we lived in an era of what were known as uh, the era of, of, of special charters, which meant that in order to get a corporate charter, you had to go to your state legislature and get the state legislature uh, to pass a, uh, and this goes back to the, to the original, uh, uh, to you know, pre-revolutionary war times, to pass a special statute saying, you have a court, you, we'll give you a corporate charter to put in this turnpike or transport this stuff or build this bridge or et cetera, et cetera. And this was just a, 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 a like, um, fertilizer for cronyism, of course, because the way people got these charters was by paying bribes. And there were, and, and even in the most, you know, in, uh, and, and it's absolutely, you know, universally, universally acknowledged that, um, you know, these charters came with monopoly power and people paid a lot of money for them. And Congress and, and, and these state legislators took uh, a piece of the cut. Now, this is, this is non-controversial. What's what's what should interest us? What interests me is that it stopped. It stopped. So we should look at what what conditions occurred. What is it that occurred in the economy? Uh, because forget my cynicism, but I don't really think that the legislators in New Jersey and New York uh, at this time you know, said, "Oh, I I'm tired of taking." <laughs> uh, I, I think we have a better way to do this. And could we move now to incorporation by right for 35, 50 bucks and go onto the internet and um, you know form a corporation immediately in, in any state, including uh, most uh, notably dollars. So what, what happened? Well, what happened was that the demand for these special charters began to decrease. People stopped being willing to pay very much for them because the uh, 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 courts began to enforce the uh, uh, the Commerce Clause and the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the Constitution to say that, well, if you don't get a charter in New York, you can get a charter somewhere else and go to New York and do business. And so if I go to my legislator and that person is unwilling to grant me a charter, then I go to another legislator. So these states had to compete among themselves the price went down, and eventually the sort of uh, value-maximizing strategy from states was uh, to enter into what we now know as a jurisdictional competition for corporate charters, and we've gotten rid of we've gotten rid of of, uh, of uh, cronyism. Um, so, so that that's a regulatory change. You know, I, I think about uh, uh, 
you know, a, a, a couple of other examples are pretty well known to us if we think about them. You know, you think about, um, well, it's, you know, Mark, so of course we should think a little bit, I guess, about uh, basketball. Um, you know, how is it that, um, you know, that, that, that uh, this, you can think of this, the old era in NCAA basketball, particularly uh, in, this, in the Southeastern Conference of, um, of uh, all white basketball teams. Well, how did that ever go away? Well, the way that went away is, is I'm sure many of you are aware, is that um, uh, a couple of uh, basketball coaches, particularly one at, at Texas Tech, if I can say that in this round, uh, so said, you know, if we, have, uh, uh, if we don't discriminate in picking our basketball team, we're going to do pretty well. And uh, when finally you had a, a, uh, a mixed race Texas Tech team beat uh, a all white University of Kentucky basketball team in the NCAA championships, uh, there were, had, were, were uh, a tremendous amount of, then, 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 then these walls uh, began finally to, uh, uh, to, to uh, break down. And I remember I was thinking about Texas Western. Texas Western, I'm sorry. Okay, I knew that. No, thank you. Um, <laughs> so think, you know, I, I thought about this when I was a, I was a, a summer law clerk uh, when I was in law school at a, a law firm in Honolulu. Uh, it was, uh, and uh, uh, you could you could look at the letter Ed. These Honolulu, these Hawaii law firms were becoming more and more competitive, and you could see kind of historically discriminated against groups, kind of. Uh, Japanese and Filipino and other Asian names percolating to the top of these letterheads in the same way that you could in New York firms and with uh, Jewish names on the on the letterhead. So, uh, really, the the uh, the uh, the uh, the existence of cronyism is 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 kind of like a biological growth, and it's going to grow whenever the environment is appropriate for. And the only way to get rid of it uh, is to create an environment in which uh, it's not uh, there's not a payoff to demanding uh, uh, or or uh, seeking special favors, uh, and so there's no incentive on the part of the uh, uh, government branch to uh, to supply them, and that requires uh, the twin. Uh, 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 the sort of uh, the, the, the twin uh, characteristics in an economy of uh, a very strong uh, uh, competitive environment where uh, cronyism is a luxury that competitors cannot afford and, uh, uh, and then a lack of regulation so that uh, the one cannot, one has to compete in the marketplace rather than in places like Gucci Gulch in Washington uh, for business success. Thank you. Okay, so as I indicated, uh, we've left some time for, for questions. If any of you have any questions of our panelists, and then if, uh, if all the questions are exhausted, then the panelists can give something in closing. But it's more important to hear from, uh, from you. Now, the, uh, the problem we have is that we're sort of microphone challenged because uh, we don't have any uh, mics uh, out there. So you're really going to have to uh, to speak loudly enough that everyone can uh, can hear you. And if that if that doesn't work, then I'll have to have the questioners come up and use one of these mics to give your question. But that's logistically a little bit cumbersome. So uh, anyway, let's uh, let's go ahead and get um, and get some uh, uh, get some questions. Um, I'll start near the front. People who sit who are well who are willing to sit in the front get a little bit of privilege because everyone else comes in. It's like church, you want to sit in the back. So, anyway, so, so let me start right, right here. But we will try to move some around the room. So can you stand up and speak loudly? It's worse than law school, I know. Um, so it seems it seems that GM and Chrysler, uh, AIG and Bear Stearns are all kind of no-brainers on the crony capitalism front. But what about uh, Solyndra and Fisker and you know all the different sort of de uh, Department of Energy uh, projects that have gone under in the last five six years. They're no brainers, also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's. Uh, <laughs> I heard 
concerned was that this seems to be a government created problem, but what confuses me is that the, a lot of the solutions I heard was that we're looking for the government to solve it as well, as opposed to turning to free markets. And it seems to me from the definitional question that crony capitalism sounds an awful lot like regulatory capture as well, where, and so, I, what I'm interested in is, that seems to be a fairly old problem. Are there new solutions to that? <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, you make a good point. It's a very difficult question. And the, the um, you know, the, the lesson I would draw, say, from this uh, you know, experience with jurisdictional competition is, what you've had is judges coming in and, and, and for lack of a poor, uh, 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 elegant way of phrasing it, imposing a, what I would describe as a libertarian, free market uh, 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 interpretation of the, of, the, of the Constitution. You know, if, if, uh, if uh, we clone Richard Epstein and put him in, uh, you know, in a lot of judgeships, then this problem would, would likely go away given his interpretation of takings and and the Commerce Clause and the like. But and, and no one else would ever get in an edge uh, in a word, no. right? That would be <laughs> Oral arguments would be around the clock. But If a government comes up, if I'm your congressperson, as an example I use, and I say, I'm going to help you because you're my constituent, and I am the constituent, and I say, I would like to help you, congressperson, get elected or get reelected. I'll ask my company members to vote for you, or whatever, the, the implicit transaction, right? Because it, it's somewhat of a transaction. But it's a transaction we think is it's very, it's, it's part and parcel of what we consider representative government. That this is what a lot of Congress people do is that they reach out to their constituents and some of those constituents would be businesses, right? And hypothetically, let's assume that it's that level. I think that itself is different from saying, look, hire some of my friends on your business. Do this, because it's like you're trading in a different currency. And that currency is not the one the congressperson should be trading in or the one we think the business should be trading in. But businesses interacting with government, and I have to say, and this may be a little bit different from what I'm I think it's just a feature, interacting with government and trying to influence government. It's, favorite. it's a feature of modern regulatory states wherever. If you, and let me clarify that, once you start off with the premise, Professor Epstein and others who have looked at the origin of self-interest, that there is a dark side to self-interest. So you have to set up an SEC, or you have to set up something that constrains business in some fashion because of the dark side, maybe fraud that you're trying to capture, right? Manipulating your documents. And then the SEC exists. It now has control over business. Sometimes it can overstretch. The business has every incentive to try to reach out to the government and say, look, this is how you're harming me and this is how you're helping me. And that's a future of what I would call modern regulatory states. And I don't think that that I would classify as crony capitalism, even if it results in benefits for the business. I think the key issue is when the business deals in a currency and the member of Congress deals in a currency that we think none of them should be dealing in. Go appoint my friends to your board. 
We think it's suboptimal for both parties because the company's not going to gain much from getting people appointed to the board. Or we, th we think, let's say, for example, the University of Texas. Take this as an example. This is a classic example of cronyism. University of, uh, here's non-cronyism. University of Texas, the, the president goes in to talk to the governor and says, you should do this thing for our university. Legislature should probably do the following thing with the university. Expand, buy a building, whatever, do this, right? The government says, fine, you've lobbied me, I'm going to agree to do it. That, I think, we think is fine. You're a land-grant institution, whatever, you can do it that way. What if the president now goes on to the government and says, I need you to do this following thing, and I'll allow you, I'll give your children special privilege to enter into Texas. We think this is a occurrence. The president does, should not have, as part of his performance role, granting the governor's children access to this university or his friends. It's not his business. And we also think, we also think that the governor should not be in the business of seeking access for his own children or the children of his friends into the universe. That's where cronyism comes in. It's something we think is not within their performance roles. But sometimes granting favors can be part of their performance role. And we have to separate the two. If we conflate the two, we have a boundary problem. Regardless of whether we think both of them are bad, we still have to separate the two. That's my position. All right, let's go over to the far section. Um, okay. Uh, my name is Ms. Holly Katzen from the University of Florida, and this question is for Mr. Uh, Allison. You spoke at great length about uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the fact that they were leveraged uh, a thousand to one. Uh, but of course, that leverage ratio, as I understood it, came about from the primary activity of underwriting as opposed to the pure creation of these instruments. And of course that underwriting dates back to the original May, which I believe was Ginny May, uh, which was meant to help veterans and then subsequently these organizations came about to uh, help uh, investments and in homes in impoverished areas. So do you believe that these organizations in their form now should not exist at all or is there still room for this uh, original activity of underwriting in the economy and perhaps a more limited and more contained scope? I don't think that uh, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, or the FHA should exist. They're not necessary. <clears throat> when I first went into the banking business, probably 90% of the financing done for houses was done by private institutions of one kind or the other. The underwriting standards were much more rational typically 20% down payments, uh, and the default rates were almost zero. It was very good for homeowners, and it was very good for the economy. Freddie and Fannie were largely created to subsidize homeownership. Uh, home builders like them a lot for the subsidizing their business and realtors at the expense of the taxpayers, and economically, very bad idea. Now, it's nice to own a home, but homes are consumption. You do not want to subsidize excessive consumption because that is equivalent to eating your seed corn. Um, the reason this was such a bad misinvestment in our economy is we overconsumed, And that left less capital to create manufacturing plants, technology, educational investments, agriculture that produce jobs in, in the future. So there is no rational reason to, uh, to uh, incent excessive consumption, uh, and it has bad economic consequences. So I, 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 and, and by the way, the market <coughs> just announced a year from now, Freddie Fannie and FHA are all gone. There will be a private market for housing. The interest rates would be slightly higher, as they should be. The underwriting standards would be slightly tighter, as they should be. And it would be much more rational, and we'd have more capital to do more productive things. And we'd have a higher standard of living. My name is uh, Nicholas Baker. My comments and questions are primarily for Mr. Allison. Uh, first of all, go Target. Uh, secondly, uh, we heard a lot today about how we should have a separation between state and commerce, about misregulation, about crony capitalism, uh, examples where the government and the state doesn't necessarily curtail free markets. But it's interesting to me because a lot of times uh, forerunners of modern libertarian or conservative economic thought uh, thought there was sort of a role for the government to actively play in free markets. So Friedrich Hayek wrote, in individualism and economic order that government involvement is necessary sometimes for free markets in order to have competition, to set some ground rules, to set some regulations, to prevent monopolies. So my question for you is, based on your involvement in the industry and in academia, 
Can you give us some examples of contrast to chronic capitalism where government regulations are helpful, where government active involvement in the free market is a beneficial thing for free markets rather than government only being able to help if it stays completely out of the way? Um, I don't agree with how I act on that issue. Uh, I think he certainly wasn't libertarian in that regard. Um, the, uh, in my experience, the rule of law is incredible. Rule of law is incredibly important. There's no question about that. Uh, we have to be able to have standards, <laughs> and we have to have uh, enforcement of contracts. It, it, today, uh, one of the problems we have is we don't have enforcement of contracts, and that is a huge issue. But after that, I can't think of any government rule or regulation that I've seen in my business, or any business that actually improved economic activity in ways. I can't think of a single one. Uh, it's interesting to me. <coughs> I, yeah, I started out as a small business lender, and uh, <coughs> um, I, I hear about all these programs for small businesses. But if you actually, if you actually ask the people that ultimately become small business entrepreneurs and become successful, you know what they want? They want to be left alone. I was meeting with the world. <laughs> I was meeting with the World Development Bank, and they have all these plans to help these entrepreneurs in, in foreign countries. And all they want to do is not have somebody steal what they produce. They want to the law. So I don't think regulation is promoting economic well-being. Rule of law is necessary.
John Rowland, Constitution.org. Question for each of you. If there is war, were one piece of legislation or litigation that you would like to propose to fix any problem in this area, what would it be? I would appeal <laughs> a long list <laughs> of laws <laughs> would be my, my proposal. Uh, I think that uh, uh, perhaps a, a greater emphasis on, uh, on transparency and uh, uh, real embarrassment, real sense of embarrassment that you might not mean necessarily a law. That is that, um, you know, it used to be said that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Warren Buffett used to say that, uh, you know, he doesn't want anybody working for him that would do anything that he wouldn't want reprinted on the front page of the Washington Post. Uh, but the thing is that, you know, right now, um, uh, it seems that uh, even if you do something bad, and it's reported, uh, the kind of um, uh, penal social penalties associated with doing something bad really aren't there uh, to the extent that we would want. I think that there's more of a, uh, a change in terms of uh, social notions of what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. Maybe we wouldn't need as many laws. No, I, I, I just, uh, and maybe taking a sort of slightly contrary view, I do think that every single situation you find yourself in, you just don't go and say what is starting off from baseline and say, I'm going to assume away certain things. You don't assume away a political environment. We all live in a political environment. And the more it looks like businesses don't look good to people, the more you're going to get the kind of populist behavior that often results in what I would call counterproductive legislation. How do you deal with those things? You can preemptively have legislation in place, right, and have rules in place that minimize the possibility of what I would call fraud and inhabitants. I would say fraud in particular, more than cronyism. Deal with that, make people perceive that there's no fraud in the system, right? Then they're willing to buy into the system. If they perceive that there's fraud, you're gonna open the door for so many actors to exploit anti-corporate sensibility, sensibility and go off in so many directions that are gonna be If I like, could, I, I, I have to choose one. I guess I get rid of the federal income tax. <laughs> that way we stop feeding the beast. Of the <laughs> uh, let's go to the very back. Uh, you just mentioned uh, policing fraud and things like that, and uh, I think Todd Frank and other bills have at least paid lip service to doing that. But at what point has the uh, Federal Reserve's uh, activism in uh, promoting price stability seemingly at all costs uh, kind of told the players in the market that enforcement is not really credible? Um, I, I think you probably did not mean pursuing price stability at all costs. You, know, you probably meant financial stability because you know, as, as many of you you know, are probably, you know, many of you are, pro are probably concerned right now in terms of the, the kinds of monetary policies that the Fed is uh, pursuing uh, uh, really jeopardizes, uh, uh, you know, raises the distinct prospect of uh, really serious inflation in a number of years. And, and in terms of, uh, you know, the, the Fed, uh, in terms of uh, price, in terms of financial stability, there's another aspect to it, uh, kind of another aspect to a very rich question, and one that I didn't touch on, closely related, which is the relationship between what the Fed has been doing over the uh, quite a number of years and the possibility of an asset, another creating another asset price bubble. Uh, that Jeremy Stein, uh, for instance, recently gave a speech where he worried publicly about this issue. And I think that this is a very serious concern. When you have 0% interest rates, you're practically forcing a lot of people into the stock market. And there is a real concern in terms of what might happen when you take, when you eventually have to withdraw uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, injection, John. 
I would totally agree with that. I think uh, <coughs> Fed is creating enormous inflationary risk. We'll see how, how that uh, goes about. And also, it's doing something very interesting that I think is an effort. It is redistributing wealth from old people that have saved and giving it to people that are borrowed. They can't, they can't afford their diapers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> holding interest rates below what they would be in the marketplace. And in the banking business, you get to see that. We have mostly middle class clients. A lot of them are older widows, is a classic example, who say really are. They were expecting to be able to live on the interest income on their savings, and now they're having to consume their savings. Because for, for an active the Federal Reserve is consciously choosing to hold rates below what they ought to be. That is a massive redistribution of wealth <clears throat> that I would act, argue is unethical. And, and, and that has consequences in a society when government agencies are choosing to do those kind of activities. And there's no way that somebody that's 80 years old is going to make it up if the economy recovers. Of course, it, it, there's no evidence that his policy has worked because of the issues that we were just talking about. Time for a couple more questions over here. We heard from uh, Mr. Macy, you had an interesting point talking about how there are small things that have made big differences when it came to either a, a basketball team or how the Supreme Court decided to enforce certain provisions of the Constitution that allowed contracts and uh, corporations to be incorporated across the country. And I thought there's a really great question before about what piece of legislation that could be passed that would make a difference. Unfortunately, I think we've seen this Congress in the last couple of sessions of Congress really not wanting to do much of anything right up to the point of just slash and burn with the budget, not wanting to bring us back to a break. So taking it away from Congress and not putting our faith in them to do that one magic bullet piece of legislation, do you think there's anything that could be done that is maybe non-traditional, the hiring the, the African-American basketball player, the Jewish law partner, the interpreting the Constitution differently to change corporations uh, that type of a non-traditional thing that really could make some sort of a difference in the coming next couple of years that would see a more resurgence of capitalism that doesn't have the cronyist aspects. Is there something that doesn't require Congress that's just waiting for the right person at the right time to do it? See, the problem is that, is that the folks who are in the private sphere are faced with a very terrible choice, which is you either start doling out money to politicians or you go out of business. You know, this was the point that was being made about, about Microsoft. You know, there used to be, there's a famous story about the so-called uh, uh, milker bills in Chicago that a, a friend of mine, Fred McChesney, wrote about in a, in a, in a book, um, uh, it, which, is, which is called Money for Nothing. And the, and the city council in uh, Chicago uh, occasionally would, this is when Chicago is the meat packing center of the, of the country, would uh, introduce a, a proposed city ordinance which would, which would widen or, or make more narrow the gauge of the railroad tracks going into Chicago. And if they did this, then all the big companies, uh, railroads bringing in uh, 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 Meat to to Chicago would have to uh, take their uh, all, unload all their stuff and then reload it on these new trains to fit the new gauge of the track. And so every now and then, you know, the guys in the city council would collect a lot of money to get them to back off on this legislative proposal. And it was worth, from an economic perspective, they're willing to to pay up to, but not greater than the cost that this ordinance would pass on them if it were. Put through. So what the problem is, you know, every, which means that the people in the private sector are kind of in a prisoner's dilemma, in the sense that if I have four or five competitors and I stop playing the payola game, then they get awarded all the contracts, I go out of business. So that's the Darwinian process that I, I was I was talking about. And I, you know, there really is no, uh, you know, people have a choice: uh, are they going to, you know, compete in the market space? Are they going to compete in the political space? And, the, and it's not a moral question. It's how are you going to, uh, how are you going to uh, you know, it, uh, maximize the prospects for your survival? So, you know, I, uh, you know, so, so uh, you know, unless there's some 
true, I mean, this is like a tea party sort of thing, it's a kind of massive, uh, right, it's not something that somebody can just say, well, I'm not going to uh, do it anymore, because it's, it's a game of survival, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a leisure sort of thing, or a choice, I mean, really. All right, that's all the time that we're going to have, uh, unfortunately, for questions, but I do thank all of you for the good questions. Uh, Gene Meyer needed to make an announcement before we adjourn. Gene Meyer, President of the Federal Society, I wanted to mention one thing very quickly. All, all of our speakers have written, written a lot of wonderful things. Uh, one of them, uh, John Allison, has a book out, which he, which he, he mentioned before, uh, on the causes of the financial crisis. We have a bunch of copies of that, which we intended to bring here. And uh, I, I failed to communicate that, so as a result, they are not here. Um, but what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to make we're going to make them available to any of you who will email us with a request for that for a copy of this book. We we will send it to you. Uh, uh, we, we 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 will do that free. Given the the the, uh, the honor co uh, part of this is if we send it to you, you actually look it over thoroughly. <laughs> we, 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 we we think since we didn't bring it here the way we intended to, that's the least we can do. So I want to thank you. The, uh, the reception is at 9 o'clock, and it's in the big room behind where you registered. And before we leave, just one more thing to take care of. Please give our wonderful panelists uh, your thanks. For your